Hey FRT community. So over the last 48 hours, I received multiple questions. I don't know what video prompted this, but multiple questions regarding recruitment maneuvers. This is when you have a region in your, in your, in your lungs that has become atelectatic and you need to re-recruit those alveoli. So we're going to break this down. I'm going to give you just a quick overview of what some of the research out there is talking about in regards to recruitment maneuvers. Okay, so uh, this is the topic. The first question is, is when do we need to consider doing or performing a recruitment maneuver? Where? Well, there's a couple different scenarios. A lot of the research is based around ARDS, but basically anytime you have a, a chest x-ray that supports regional atelectasis, you should re consider a recruitment maneuver. Anytime you have a PF ratio less than 250, you should be thinking, maybe I need to do a recruitment maneuver. Some of the research says less than 300. So anytime you have an oxygenation issue, you need to ask yourself, would a recruitment maneuver help this patient oxygenate better? And that's pretty much where you're starting. Okay, uh, if you have, let's say you have a ventilation problem and your oxygenation status is great, you're probably not considering a recruitment maneuver for that patient. You, no signs of atelectasis on your chest x-ray, you got an acidotic pH, high CO2, normal oxygenation, PF ratios, whatever, 305, 310. That patient probably does not fall in the, in the realm of let's do a recruitment maneuver. But the opposite is true. PF ratio of 110, atelectasis on your chest x-ray, terrible static compliance. Let's think about a recruitment maneuver. So let's break down the different types of recruitment maneuvers because there's a lot of different types of them and they've evolved over the years. Okay, so uh, the first one we're going to talk about is sustained inflation. Now sustained inflation is where you take your patient on a mechanical ventilator and you put them into CPAP and you raise the CPAP anywhere from 30 to 45 and you hold for 30 to 40 seconds. So this is a quick, this is a short recruitment maneuver. You take your, you take your patient out of the volume mode or the pressure control mode that they're in and you put them in CPAP. Now this is super important. Do not just raise your peak to 30 because you have a tidal volume. If you stay in volume control, you stay in pressure control, you have a volume or a mechanical breath that is scheduled to be happening probably within the next 30 to 40 seconds. So you raise the peep to 30 and then you give a tidal volume on top of that, you're at a big risk for barotrauma. So it's super important that you understand we're going to go to CPAP without any mechanical breaths. Now the patient can breathe spontaneously, that's fine. But CPAP without any mechanical breaths is where you want to be to prevent barrel trauma from happening when you raise this pressure to 30 to 45 centimeters of water pressure. Now you're going to hold it there for 30 to 40 seconds. During that time, you're monitoring your patient's SpO2, their, their cardiac output, their, their hemodynamic status, and you're going to watch them for any adverse reactions or any adverse effects from this quick increase in PEEP. Now, after the 30 to 40 seconds, you put them back on what they were on. If you don't see improvement in oxygenation or static compliance being your plateau pressure, then you can repeat this sustained inflation maneuver just a short time later, but this time you're going to go up to 35 and you're going to hold it for 30 to 40 seconds. Monitor your patient. Watch for adverse effects, right? Take them back to where they were. Short time later, up it again. So some research goes as high as 45, some stops at 40. But the point is, is if 30 doesn't work, short time later, do it again at 35. If that doesn't show any impact, then a short time later at 40. And you're only holding these for 30 to 40 seconds, and then you go back to the mode that they were in. Okay, that's called sustained inflation. Now the other type of sustained inflation is where you increase peak to 20 centimeters of water pressure, and then you step down by two centimeters of water pressure every couple of minutes. This is another type of recruitment maneuver that falls underneath the sustained 
inflation technique. So increase PEEP to 20 centimeters of water pressure. You're going to continue to ventilate at this pressure. You're going to keep your mode in if you're in, in, in volume control. 6 mLs per kilo of ideal body weight. Tidal volume is set. Then you will go to 20 and step down watching and monitoring for adverse effects of the PEEP. Okay? That's the first method, sustained inflation. Now... There's some studies that have shown that what might perhaps be a better approach to recruitment maneuvers is the stepwise approach. So this is the stepwise approach. Now this is the opposite of what we just did. Because what you're going to do here is you're going to add, you're going to increase PEEP plus 2 every couple of minutes okay so every three to five minutes so we'll go q three to five minutes and what you're doing is that every step so if you start it if you start at five then you're going to increase to eight for three to five minutes and then you're going to increase to ten three to five minutes and then you're going to increase to twelve three to five minutes now what you're doing at each of these steps or each of these increments what you're doing is is you're monitoring SPO2, PF ratio, static compliance, and driving pressure. Now, when you're talking about static compliance and driving pressure, those numbers revolve around your plateau pressure. And ideally, if you're increasing these, you want to increase them incrementally by two, but you want to make sure that your plateau pressure stays less than 30 centimeters of water pressure. Lots of research out there that shows that when plateau pressure rises above 30, outcomes deteriorate. So, you want a goal here is to get your baseline up without having much of an impact on your plateau pressure. You do that by monitoring oxygenation, static compliance, and driving pressure. Remember, driving pressure, kind of a new theory, but it's plateau minus peep. So, if your plateau pressure started out at 20 then your driving pressure at 5 was 15. When you go to 8, if your plateau pressure stays at 20, then your driving pressure is now 12, and your driving pressure has actually decreased now, and that's good. You want a smaller driving pressure. Now what you do is say, well, when do you stop? How, how high do you go? You keep going up by 2, <clears throat> excuse me, every 3 to 5 minutes until you see this inc incline. You see you're, you're getting better. Peep's going up. Oxygenation is improving, driving pressure is, is, is staying the same or decreasing, static compliance is improving with each step. Now, when you get to a point to where you go, oh wait, we're having negative impacts, now my static compliance is now worse, my driving pressure is now increased, and my oxygenation is not, I'm not seeing a big improvement, maybe even a decline in my oxygenation, then what you do is you step back to the point at which you had things at the best. So if you had, if we went to 12 and then we went up to 14 and negative impacts started being visible at 14, then we would just step back down and we would hold at 12 and we would continue to monitor. So that's the stepwise approach. This says we're basically searching for optimal PEEP here. The PEEP level that gives us best oxygenation, best static compliance and least driving pressure, optimal PEEP, okay? That's the stepwise approach. Now, there's an older, I say old, I'm going to say older technique that was called a side breath. Side breaths were built into a lot of the early ventilators, the, some of the first ventilators. They had these side breaths built into them where ever so often the vent would give a breath at one and a half times the set tidal volume. Now, this fell out of practice and actually became obsolete on a lot of the newer modern-day ventilators. You can put them in on some vents, new vents, but for there was a period of time where you, side breaths were not an option on ventilators. Even with that, there's research that's bringing side breaths back into the picture and it's saying that patients breathing in CPAP with pressure support ventilation could benefit from... Um, and every 60 seconds or, or every 30 seconds side breath, so one to two side breaths per minute. 
Now, you don't have an option to put a side breath into CPAP with pressure support. But what you could do to achieve that, and this is what the research talks, talks about doing, is, is you take somebody on, in PSV, CPAP with PSV, right? This is the mode that they're in. And we want to give them size. So what we're going to do is switch them over to SIMV, pressure control. So now, and we're only going to set a, a rate of one to two breaths per minute. This means the vent is going to allow the patient to breathe spontaneously pretty much all of the time, except for these one to two breaths per minute, where the vent's going to come in and give a pressure control breath, and it's going to sustain that, that breath for an extended time. And this is what they're considering or calling a side method that's kind of being researched more today. So what you do is you want a ratio of one to one, when you give this breath, and that usually comes with an eye time of three to four seconds. So you have this eye time for three to four seconds. You really can't control the, the one to one, the, the ratio, because you're only giving one breath a minute. So the rest of the time, it's all spontaneous breathing. So ideally, what you're doing is shooting for a three to four second sustained pressure control breath at a higher pressure. And that will pretty much create a side breath one to two times per minute, okay? So that's what this is. You gotta understand that when you're talking about SIMV, anything that's not, that doesn't belong to the vent is essentially pressure support ventilation. That's what it is. So if you throw somebody in SIMV with one breath, it's basically pressure support ventilation on top of CPAP with one breath per minute which could function like a cybra, okay? So it's kind of interesting to see that come back in and the creative ways that people are doing that. Now there are a couple of ventilators, a couple of vent modes that are designed with a focus for, for alveolar recruitment. And I'm just gonna mention two of them. I know there's a bunch of other ones, but I'm just gonna mention these two. So we're talking about APRV and high frequency oscillation ventilation. So this is the high frequency vent, and this is the APRV, mode APRV. Now I've done another video on APRV, so I'm not gonna get into it. But essentially what these modes of mechanical ventilation do is they put a focus on increasing your mean airway pressure substantially without adding a lot of pressure on top of your mean airway pressure. So it's not uncommon to have somebody in APRV with a peak pressure of 24, this is your PIP, and have a MAP or a mean airway pressure of 21. That's typically not what we see. We typically see mechanical breaths happen and we get a PIP, you know, we get a PIP of 28 and then we have a MAP of 16. That's typically more, there's a bigger difference between a MAP and a PIP. But if you look at this, these modes, high frequency and APRV will substantially take your MAP from 16 take it up to 21, and we'll also minimize your peak inspiratory pressures because there's no breath happening, there's no positive pressure breath happening on top of these higher peak levels and these sustained mean airway pressures. So, so these two modes are also associated with recruitment maneuvers, but these wouldn't, you really wouldn't call them recruitment maneuvers, but they are modes that could be considered to enhance and to promote alveolar recruitment, okay? Now, Some of the research actually includes prone positioning in recruitment maneuvers. Um, so you know that's there, a lot of research on that. Uh, prone positioning basically uh, takes the weight of the heart, flips it over, gets it off of the, of the, um, left, side, the left lung, and, and you have better aeration, you have better VQ, mismatch, better, uh, VQ ratio. And, and those type of things. So if you've worked much with the prone, with the rotor prone or even just prone positioning, you know that sometimes it works really good and sometimes it doesn't, okay? And that's kind of where you are with all of these recruitment maneuvers. So I wanna, I wanna come back and just talk about this. No matter what recruitment maneuver you are working with, because here's what the data shows. All of the data pretty much focused on the physiological effects of these different maneuvers. Few of the research actually focused on outcomes associated, patient outcomes associated with these maneuvers. So it's really hard to tell or to identify if the recruitment maneuvers are actually improving outcomes. The other thing is, is, is 
very few of them, the research out there, they're pretty much focused on one of these type of recruitment maneuvers. There's very few studies out there that compare results from sustained inflation to stepwise approach. There's just studies that reflect better physiological effects from each of these maneuvers. None of them show or support better outcomes with this. But here's what they do show. During a recruitment maneuver, adverse effects are possible and you need to monitor for them. So things such as desaturations, you have your, your, your oxygenation can actually get worse. Things like um, uh, negative impacts on the cardiovascular system. So decreasing cardiac output, uh, those type of things happen during recruitment maneuvers. Not all the time, but they are present and you need to watch for them. Um, also, also over distension is a negative adverse effect of recruitment maneuvers. Very rarely do you actually see any type of true barrel traumas. One of the studies showed that there was no increase in air leaks with the chest tube system that was in place. So while you have these, net, these negative adverse effects, you need to watch for them and monitor them. That's the key here, guys. Don't put these patients. This is critically. This is critical thinking. This is respiratory therapy critically doing our job at the bedside and identifying best oxygenation, best static compliance, best driving pressure. We're the only people in the hospital talking about those things. Oxygenation, obviously not, but static compliance, driving pressure. Only people in the hospital talking about it. Besides, maybe your pulmonologist. You should be talking about that with your physicians. But we're the only ones monitoring them. And so if you're at the bedside for, for, for 30 minutes doing a stepwise approach, then you're doing your job and you're making a positive impact in your patient. And you're hopefully improving that patient's plan of care and you know their overall, their overall condition and, and, and helping them get off the ventilator quicker. Which if that's the case, studies don't support this, but if that's the case, then you are improving outcomes. But this is what you get paid to do. Okay, so understand recruitment maneuvers. Hey, put in me a comment down below. Let me know what type of recruitment maneuvers you see in your area. Because here in Texas, I guarantee you we do things different than what's happening in New York, California, you know, wherever it may be, you know, Arizona, you know, wherever, Colorado. Tell me what you're doing in your facilities because we want to know. We want to share these ideas. And we all want to learn from each other. So throw them up here. Talk to me. Let me know what's going on. Hey, best wishes, guys.